Surah Al-An'am was revealed according to most of the Mufassireen in the final year of the Holy Prophet in Mecca before he migrates to Medina. And this is significant. When we read Surah Al-An'am, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the Holy Prophet and the small Muslim, the small vulnerable Muslim community at the time. So the historical context of Surah Al-An'am is as such. It's been 12 years since the Holy Prophet began his mission. He's been preaching to, the, to Meccan society for 12 years. He's been inviting and propagating the message of Islam for over a decade, for 12 years. And his invitation and his preaching was met with what? Opposition. They used to antagonize the Prophet. They persecuted the Prophet. They ridiculed him. They would physically and psychologically abuse the Holy Prophet and his community and his followers. Furthermore, Surah Al-An'am was revealed to the Prophet after he lost Abu Talib and Khadija. So this is a very, very trying time in the life of Rasulullah and the small Muslim community. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recently lost his two most important supporters in, in Khadija and Abu Talib. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is now deprived of virtually all worldly support. You find that the majority of his followers had already migrated to Habasha, to Abyssinia. So Rasulullah now is left with a few family members, a few followers in Mecca. Khadija has passed away. Abu Talib has passed away. It's not safe for most of the Muslims to remain in Mecca. Many of them have left their homes. They just experienced a, they're still in the, uh, in the middle of, a, of an economic and a social boycott. So the future of Islam is very gloomy. Many Muslims don't even know if Islam is going to survive. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, being the messenger of Allah, the Prophet has incredible spiritual endurance but at the end of the day, he's a human being who's going to experience emotional fatigue, who's going to experience mental fatigue. So you find that one of the reasons why Surah Al-An'am was revealed to the Prophet in one, at one time, and it was not gradually, is because Surah Al-An'am is really a surah that's, that gives a lot of consolation to the Prophet. You see the Quran in Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, verse 82. So we understand now that the Prophet and especially the Muslims, they're demoralized. They've, they've experienced loss. They are economically at a disadvantage. They've been driven out of their homes. They don't have anywhere to go. There's no safe refuge for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sees that his Prophet is fatigued. He sees that the Muslims are demoralized and the best medicine for them is what? The Quran. Allah doesn't reveal a handful of verses. He reveals an entire surah to the Holy Prophet and to the Muslims. And this is why Allah says in Surah Al-Isra verse 82, Surah 17 verse 82, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says, and we reveal from the Qur'an that which is a source of healing and mercy for the believers. So this revelation, the revelation of these 165 verses was a sort of healing for the Prophet and the Muslim community who was experiencing this trauma, the trauma of loss. Many Muslims lost their lives. Many of them have lost everything. They've lost all their, their homes, their finances. They've lost family members. They've been excommunicated from their families. So Surah Al-An'am is a Meccan Surah and it was revealed in the last year approximately of the Prophet's tenure in Mecca. Now, before we move forward, I want to give you some historical background on Meccan Surahs in general so we can appreciate 
really appreciate Surah Al-An'am and, and the message of Surah Al-An'am. The Prophet, as I mentioned, spent 13 years in Mecca. You can divide the Meccan period into four stages. So those 13 years, you can break them up into four stages. The first stage is the first three years. From the Ba'tha, when at the age of 40, when Rasulullah began, when he was appointed by Allah as a Rasul. So from zero to three, this is the first stage of the Meccan period. And this is a stage characterized by secrecy, meaning the Holy Prophet was inviting people to Islam in secret. He identified certain individuals. He spoke to them in private. So there were select individuals who were approached by the Prophet and they were invited to Islam. So for the first three years, from the age of 40 to the age of 43, Meccan society, the common people of Mecca had no idea that there was a religion called Islam and there was this movement that was being pioneered by the Holy Prophet. So this was a time of secrecy. There was no antagonism. There was no persecution. There was no abuse that took place during these first three years. It was a completely secretive, overt mission. Then year number three to five in Mecca. This is when the Holy Prophet is given the divine command to take Islam public. And it began with the verse, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your nearest of kin. Begin the public da'wah to Islam. From year three to year five, that is when the harassment and the abuse began. Now, the abuse initially began with what? People would mock the Prophet. They would ridicule him. They would call him Sahar and Majnoon. So the, the harassment and the abuse was in the form of words. But gradually, when the Meccans, specifically the aristocrats, of Mecca, the power brokers of Mecca, when they realized that, you know, this is, that Muhammad and his followers are serious. They're actually trying to change the status quo. They're trying to address a lot of the injustices that they see, that this is not just a band of, of followers who want to do their own rituals. They actually want to transform Meccan society and the world at large. So, the verbal abuse gradually escalated into physical abuse. Many of the mushrikeen, they started to target the poor and the vulnerable Muslims. So you have people like Bilal, you have people like Ammar ibn Yasir, who don't hail from very well-known tribes. So you have some poor Muslims who are being physically abused by the Meccans. So this is year three to five. Then you find that from year five to 10, the persecution became so severe that many Muslims could not remain in Mecca anymore. And the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recognized that his community is in danger now, that this is, it's no longer just verbal abuse. There are Muslims who are getting physically assaulted on a daily basis. You know, today we speak about Islamophobia. Islamophobia began in, in Mecca. You know, you and I, we might be verbally abused, but for the most part, you know, most of us are not going to be physically assaulted. There are cases where that does happen, but during year five through 10 in Mecca, this was the norm for Muslims to actually be physically assaulted. So the majority of the Prophet's followers, the Muslim community, the Prophet sent them on a migration. They had to migrate to Abyssinia and perhaps other places. And this is when the, and those who remained behind, the Prophet's family members who accepted Islam, there was a social and an economic boycott that was imposed on the Prophet and on the, uh, the members of Beni Hashim and other close companions. Now, you have to understand, brothers and sisters, that 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, even though the Prophet, on, on rare occasions he was physically abused, but the Prophet was suffering tremendously when he saw the likes of Bilal, when he saw the likes of Ammar ibn Yasir being tortured. It's because of the Holy Prophet truly felt pain when he saw his followers suffering. In fact, if you look at Surah at tawbah verse number 128, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us the degree of compassion and concern that the Prophet had for his followers, for the fellow, for Muslims. Allah says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Allah says, indeed there has come to you a messenger from among you. This is a man who grew up in Mecca, who understands the cultural nuances. He's not, some, he's not an outsider who's coming in to guide you. He grew up in Mecca. He understands the, the nuances and all of the challenges of Mecca. Azizun alayhima anittum. The Quran is saying that the Prophet, Allah is telling us, that the Prophet suffers when he sees you suffer. When he sees other Muslims being tortured or abused, it's not that he's the leader and he doesn't care what's happening to his followers as long as he's protected. Rasulullah would feel agony and he would feel pain and he would be distressed when he would hear that other Muslims are being targeted and tortured. Harisun alaykum bil raufun rahim. In the same way that when a mother sees her child being abused or bullied, it pains the mother. Rasulullah had the compassion of a mother and even more than that when it came to the community of the believers. So year five through 10, the persecution intensified and there, was a lot, there were a lot more incidences of physical violence towards Muslims. Then in the 10th year, this is still stage three, in the 10th year after the Ba'tha, this is when Abu Talib and Khadija pass away. Because of how severe the economic sanctions were, they had to stay out in a mountain hideout called Shi'ab Abu Talib. And the traditions say, Rasulullah he even says that there were nights where me and Bilal would go out to gather food and we would only be able to gather herbs and plants that would grow from the ground. This was the food that the Holy Prophet used to eat during those times of uh, tribulation. So Abu Talib and Khadija, they pass away. And this year becomes known as Amul Huzn. Then the fourth stage of the Meccan period from year 10 to year 13. As I said, Surah Al-An'am was revealed when? In the 12th year after the Ba'tha. So during this time, during the 10th and the 10th through the 13th year after the Ba'tha, life became truly unbearable in Mecca. It wasn't safe for even the Prophet and the few followers that remained with him to remain in Mecca because as many of you know, after the death of Abu Talib, Rasulullah was no longer safe. When Abu Talib was alive, he was concealing his faith. He was the chief of Quraysh and because of that, it put him in a negotiating position because the mushrikeen thought that he's with us but secretly he's a follower of the prophet so he was able to negotiate and protect the prophet because the mushrikeen still revered him but with the death of abu talib the holy prophet had no more protection and this is why you see in the seerah of the prophet after the death of abu talib and after the prophet loses khadija the chiefs of the tribes they get together to come up with the plan to destroy Islam and to get rid of the Prophet. And they, they contemplate imprisoning the Prophet, they contemplate banishing him, but they then come to a consensus that the only way for us to extinguish the flame of Islam is for us to murder, to murder the Prophet, to assassinate the leader of this movement. So Rasulullah now is in Mecca. He's lost Abu Talib, he's lost Khadija. Most of his followers have migrated to, to other regions to find safety. Even the Prophet himself, on one occasion, he leaves Mecca and he goes to Ta'if to seek refuge, but the people of Ta'if refuse to grant him a safe haven. So the Prophet now is in Mecca. He has no worldly support. 
His followers are vulnerable. They're being persecuted. He's not safe in Mecca and he has nowhere else to go. No one will grant him asylum. It was at this point when the Prophet and the Muslims were at an all time low, when morale was very low, when the future of Islam looked very gloomy and bleak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surat Al An'am to the Holy Prophet. So it's important for us to understand the state of the Prophet and the state of the Muslim community at the time. So Surat Al An'am is not being revealed in Medina where you know Muslims have wealth, they have a government, they have military, they have alliances. No, this is the all time low for the Muslim community during the Meccan period. Now, some of the main topics that are covered in this surah, I've, I've listed some of the main topics and they come out to seven topics and they're not in order. When we go through Surah Al-An'am, you'll find that almost all of the verses are related to at least one or more of the topics that I'm gonna share with you. So topic one, so these are the main topics or the themes of Surat Al-An'am. Number one, throughout Surat Al-An'am, you'll find that there is a, a strong refutation of shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throughout Surat Al-An'am, He proves the, the illogical nature of polytheism, of shirk, and how detrimental shirk is to the development of the human being. Because after all, man is seeking what in this life? He's seeking this internal peace. We're all chasing after what? Happiness, this, this internal state of tranquility. So refutation of shirk and an invitation to tawheed. And as we will come to understand when we study this surah, tawheed is not just an idea. Tawheed is actually an external reality. So hate is much more profound than to say that there's only one God. Secondly, the second topic in Surat Al-An'am is the elucidation of the doctrine of life after death. There are many references to the hereafter in Surat Al-An'am. And again, the reason why is because the primary audience is who? The Meccans, the Mushrikeen. And in fact, the Meccans, the Mushrikeen, the majority of the polytheists had no belief in a life after death. In fact, in Surah Al-An'am, in verse 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us some of the things that the polytheists, the pagans of Mecca used to say when the issue of, of life after death would be brought up. In verse 29 of Surah Al-An'am, Allah says what? وَقَالُوا إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ The mushrikeen of Mecca, they would say, there is nothing except this worldly life. And indeed, we will not be resurrected. There is no qiyam and there is no life after death. The only thing that exists is this life. We live 50, 60, 70, 80 years. We enjoy this life and we die and we become non-existent. Number three, in Surah Al-An'am, there is a discussion about some of the prevalent superstitious beliefs of the pagans. In fact, Surah Al-An'am takes its name from verses 136, 138, and 139 of the Surah, where many of the pagans had this belief that they would place certain dietary restrictions on themselves. They would say that this part of the cattle is permissible to eat. Women are not allowed to eat this part of the cattle. So if you look at those verses, there are many superstitious beliefs that the mushrikeen had about the lawfulness or the unlawfulness of the consumption of cattle meat. And this is why this surah takes its name from these verses, Surah al -Anar. Number four is, there is a beautiful foreshadowing in Surah Al-An'am. As I mentioned, the Muslim community doesn't even know if this religion is going to survive. But in Surah Al-An'am, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala highlights some fundamental moral principles for building an ideal Islamic community, an Islamic society. So it's as though Allah is foreshadowing that now you're worried about your survival. 
I'm going to give you fundamental principles for you to build a society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this to kind of hint to them that there is light at the end of the tunnel. This is only a temporary setback. Very soon you'll be in a position where you're, where you're going to be establishing an ideal Islamic community. Number five, the fifth topic in Surah Al-An'am, there are answers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the objections and the criticisms of the mushrikeen towards the Prophet's character and his mission. So there are certain criticisms, there's mockery, there's ridicule that takes place, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers and he replies to a lot of their criticisms and their objections and their taunting. Number six, in many verses of Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles the believers. He reminds them that victory will always be with the believers, that in the end, haq will always prevail over batil. Even if it looks that, even if it looks that batil has a leg up, this is only temporary. You see, in, when, you, when you study Western literature, you find that almost all Western literature is very tragic. If you read Shakespeare, if you read even Greek literature, they're all tragedies. Everyone, everyone dies at the end. But in the Quran, you find the beauty of the Quran is that the Quran teaches us that in the end, there's no tragedy. The, the pious, the righteous, will always prevail. They are the ones who are, will triumph. This is the worldview of the mu'min. There's no tragedy. That in the end, the, the, the believers will be victorious. And then finally, in Surah Al-An'am, there are stern warnings and, and threats that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs towards those who are standing in the way of the Holy Prophet and in the spreading of this religion that is essentially which, which is essentially aimed at giving life to the human being. Because all of us are biologically alive, but the Quran aims to give us true spiritual life in this world. Now, when you open up any tafsir of the Quran, there's usually a few ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt that speak about the merit, the fadila of the surah that we're about to study or about to recite. There is a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq where the Imam السلام, he says in Surah Al-An'am nazalat jumlatan wahida. We've already alluded to this. The Imam السلام, says Surah Al-An'am was revealed at one time. It was revealed to the Prophet in one night, in one setting. And the Holy Prophet actually dictated the entire surah to some of the scribes among his companions, and the surah was recorded the very night that it was revealed. And then the Imam says something interesting. He says, In Surah Al An'am, Nazalat Jumlatan Wahida, Wa Shayya'aha Sab'una Alfa Malakin, Heena Unzilat Ala Rasulillah. The Imam alayhi salam, he says that Surah Al An'am was revealed to the Prophet at one time and Surah Al-An'am was delivered to the Prophet and it was escorted to the Prophet along with 70,000 angels. So you find that this Surah has a sort of prestige. You know when you see a very important individual, a government official, they usually have an entourage with them. You find that Surah Al-An'am is revealed to the Prophet in this way and Allah wants to highlight to us the grandeur and the prestige and the importance of this Surah by making, by delivering the Surah to the Prophet in this majestic way. Most of the Surahs of the Quran, it's only Jibra'il revealing it to the Prophet. But Surah Al-An'am, it's Jibra'il along with 70,000 angels who are delivering this surah to the Holy Prophet. And then the Imam says, فَعَظِّمُوهَا وَبَجِّلُوهَا The Imam says, when you understand that, that this surah was revealed at once and it was delivered to the Prophet 
with the company of twenty thousand of seventy thousand angels, the Imam says, so revere this surah, hold it in high regard. That Surah Al An'am contains the name of Allah in 70 places. The name of Allah is mentioned in 70 instances within the Surah. The Imam Sallallahu Alaihi he says, if people understood the benefit within this surah, they would never abandon it. The reason why we don't take it seriously, we, we neglect the Quran, we make it secondary in our lives is because we don't see the benefit in it. We haven't understood the value of it. So with that said, we'll begin inshallah with the first ayah. And I promise inshallah, I'll, I'll try to move more quickly but just for the sake of understanding the con the historical context of the surah i'll try to cover maybe two verses in this session inshallah in the upcoming sessions i'll do my best to move a little bit uh, more quickly so we take the first ayah alhamdulillah alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard wa ja'ala dhulumati wan-nur I want to break up this first ayah into three parts. We take the first part of the ayah. Alhamdulillah alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard. All praise belongs solely to Allah who has created the heavens and the earth. I want to bring your attention, my dear brothers and sisters, to the first word in the ayah, Alhamd. Alhamd, we're all familiar with it. We recite it every day in Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alim. But how many of us understand the implication of the word Alhamd? What do we mean when we say Alhamd? Alhamdulillah. In classical Arabic, there are three words that share similar meanings, but there, there is an important distinction between the three. And these three words, and I want you to record these three words. The first is Alhamd. The second word is Al-Madh. And the third is Al-Shuk. The word Al-Madh also means praise. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very precise when it comes to word usage in the Quran. Allah's Hakim. Allah could have said al mad but He didn't. He chooses the word Alhamd. Allah could have said, Ashukru lillahi rabbil al Ashukru lillahi alladhi khalaq al samawati wal All gratitude, all thanks belongs solely to Allah. So Allah didn't say, Al Madhu Lillah, nor did he say Al Shukru Lillah, rather Allah says what? Alhamdulillah. Hamd in classical Arabic means two things, it has two implications. The first is praise, just like the word Hamd, just like the word Madh, and it also implies gratitude. Just like the word shuk. So alhamd is actually a combination of madh and shuk, praise and gratitude. I said the word madh means what? The word madh means what? Praise, right? The word madh means praise. When you praise something, in the Arabic language, the word madh can be used to praise something, a person or an object, but it doesn't, necess it doesn't necessitate that you show gratitude to that thing. So for example, in the Arabic language, I can 
if I could say Madaha Rajul Asayara, the man praised the car. He's appreciating the beauty of the car, right? But is he expressing gratitude to the car? No. He's appreciating, he's praising the beauty of the vehicle. Now, so it doesn't necessitate gratitude. Med can also be directed to in, in, inanimate objects, just like with the example of the car. So when you do med, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're expressing gratitude. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you like the object of your praise. We have many examples in history where a slave stands up and he does madh of the malik. He praises the king, but he doesn't like the king. The king is a zalim, but it's still called madh, even though, because it's praise. At the end of the day, there's no element of love or gratitude that has to be there. So, madh is a word that means praise. And it doesn't necessitate gratitude. It's also a word that can be directed to a, a intelligible, intelligible being or an inanimate object. It doesn't necessitate that you have any reverence or respect or love for the object of your praise. Similarly, shuk. You thank a person for the good that they do to you. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you praise them. Someone may have done a favor for you. You appreciate the goodness that they did for you, but you don't venerate them. You don't revere them. You're just expressing gratitude. Now with hamd, hamd is what? It's sincere praise. That's rooted in what? Mahabba and ta'zim. With madh, I said, someone can do madh. He can praise, but it can be disingenuous just like with the example of the slave who praises the king it's not sincere praise it's it's done for the sake of worldly advantages but alhamd in the arabic language refers to praise that is sincere that's rooted in love and gratitude and reverence so alhamd means that we are expressing our sincere praise. It means sincere praise. And it's also an expression of gratitude, an expression of sincere praise and deep gratitude to Allah Azza wa Jal. Now I want to share with you an excerpt from Fakhr razi Fakhr razi is a Sunni commentator of the Quran and he has a beautiful discussion about the difference between Hamd Madh and Shuk. He says, I'lam anna al madh a'ammu min al hamd. He says, No, and Fakhr Razi is an expert at the Arabic language. He says, No, that ham that madh is more general than hamd. Madh is more general than hamd. Why? Al-Madhu yahsulu lil-aqil wa li-ghayr al-aqil. He says in Arabic, the word madh can be used to praise a rational being or an inanimate object. As I said with the example, someone can praise a car or a painting. Whereas, hamd is only for an intelligible being, a conscious being. وَأَمَّا الْحَمْدِ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَحْصُلُ إِلَّا لِلْفَاعِلِ الْمُخْتَارِ عَلَى مَا يَصْدُرُ مِنْهُ مِنَ الْإِنْعَامِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ Whereas hamd can only be directed to a conscious being. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for me to do hamd when I see a painting or when I see a car. Hamd is only for a conscious being. Whereas madh is for rational or even an inanimate object. وَأَمَّا بَيَانُ أَنَّ الْحَمْدَ أَعَمُّ مِنَ الشُّكْرِ Fakhru Razi, he says, Hamd is more general than shuk. So madh is more general than hamd because madh applies to conscious beings and also inanimate objects. 
Shuk, Hamd is more general than Shuk. Why? Wa bayanu anna alhamd a'ammu min ash-shuk, fali anna alhamd ibara an ta'zim al-fa'il li ajli ma sadar anhu min al-in'am sawa'un kana dhalik al-in'am wasilin ilayk aw ila ghayrik. He says, Hamd is when you praise someone for what they give, even if you are not the beneficiary. Hamd is about praising an entity because of who they are. It's not about what they give. It's not about me being a, a recipient. Whereas shuk, you express gratitude for a blessing or a goodness when you are the beneficiary. So when we say Alhamdulillah, we are praising Allah not because of what he does for me, but because of who he is, irrespective of whether he gives me or not. وَأَمَّا الشُّكْرِ فَهُوَ عِبَارَةٌ عَنْ تَعْظِيمِهِ لِأَجْلِ إِنْعَامٍ وَصَلَ إِلَيْكِ وَحَصَلَ عِنْدَكِ So when we say Alhamdulillah, we are saying all praise, all of our sincerest praise and our deepest gratitude belongs solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this praise is sincere praise. It's a praise that's rooted in love, in reverence, in awe. It's an, an expression of gratitude. Not because we are necessarily the beneficiaries at all times. We're praising him of, because who he is, not because of what he gives us. Alhamd. Notice that the ayah doesn't say hamdan lillah. There is an alif lam in front of alham, in front of hamd. And that means alif lam here is a definite article, which means all praise. All praise. If there was no alif lam, it could be partial praise. Whereas Alif Lam makes it definitive, and we're saying that all praise belongs to Allah. This Lam in the name of Allah is called Lam al Istihqaq, the Lam of entitlement. In Arabic, we have Lam al Milkiya. If I say, for example, Al Kitabu li Muhammad, the book belongs to Muhammad, meaning the book is in his possession, he owns it. This is called Lam al Milkiya. Here, hamd is not something that's tangible and it's not something that can be possessed. That's why the Mufassirin of the Quran, they say this lam is lam al istihqaq. There is nothing worthy of hamd other than Allah. Hamd can never be directed towards anything other than Allah. You can thank someone, shukr can be directed towards makhluk, but hamd is only for al khaliq. That's why the hadith says, Man shakar al makhluk, shakar al khaliq. Whoever thanks the created, thanks the creator. So shuk can apply to a created being, but hamd cannot. Why? Because of what the Quran is telling us. Alhamdulillah. Hamd is exclusive and only Allah is entitled to it. You cannot offer hamd to any makhluk. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving and worthy of all praise. Why is Allah the only one who is worthy of all praise? One of the reasons is mentioned in the ayah. It's because what? الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The reason why only Allah is worthy of your sincerest praise and your deep gratitude and your reverence, and he is the only one worthy of being in awe of, it's because he is the one who created the heavens and the earth. Samawat, as you know, is the plural of sama. In the Quran, there are many verses that reference a specific number of samawat. Here, Allah doesn't mention how many samawat there are. He just says he created the heavens. In other verses, we understand that Allah created seven heavens. If you go, for example, to Surah Al-Mulk, 
Surah 67, verse 3, Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا The one who created seven heavens. Do not, don't confuse heavens with paradise. We're not talking about Jannah. We're talking about the skies, the heavens. To understand how vast a samawat truly is, go to Surah Safat, Surah 37, verse 6, where Allah puts the vastness of a samawat in perspective for you and I. What does He say? Surah 37, verse 6, Surah Safat, verse 6, Allah says, What? Inna zayyanna sama ad dunya bizinatin il kawakib. There are seven heavens. Allah says, We decorated the lowest heaven with stars and planets. Sama ad dunya. Dunya means the lowest. There are six heavens above it that are beyond that are imperceptible to us. The lowest heaven is decorated with stars and planets. I want to share with you a statement from astronomers and astrophysicists who spend their entire lives studying the universe. They say, and this is very this is consistent with what the Quran tells us. They say all the stars, planets, and galaxies. By the way, there are probably more than 500 billion galaxies. We live in we live in the Milky Way galaxy. The closest galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy, and it's 2.5 million light years away from us. This is our neighbor, two galaxies. Then the galaxy closest to us is the Andromeda galaxy, 2.5 million light years away, which means light travels at a speed of 186,000 miles per second light that travels that fast million years to get to the next universe. this is just two there are over 100 billion galaxies so they say all of the stars the planets the galaxies that can be seen today with microscopes make up just four percent of the universe the stars, the galaxies, everything that we see, this is only 4% of the universe. The other 96% is made of stuff astronomers can't see, detect, or comprehend. These mysterious substances are called dark energy and dark matter. الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ When you look at this verse, would you say that the earth is within the heavens? Yes. Ard is part of Samawat. Because Allah says, inna The earth is part of a Samawat. So why did Allah single out Al Ard and mention it after he mentioned a Samawat? This is like, for example, an architect saying that I designed the house and the kitchen. Well, the kitchen is part of the house. Why did you mention the kitchen? They may do this. Why? Because maybe there's maybe there's something very unique about the kitchen that he singled it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, he says, I created the heavens and the earth. Even though the earth is part of a samawat, he mentions it specifically and on its own. Why? Because he has placed his Khalifa on earth. So this earth, even though it's small and it's insignificant with respect to size when it comes to the other stars and other planets, Allah says, this Ard is special to me. It's significant to me because it houses Ashraful Makhluqat, my crowning creation. My most dignified creation dwells on this small planet. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors it and mentions it specifically. 
So this is the first part of the ayah. The second part is وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ وَالنُّورِ And he made and he appointed darknesses and light. Some of the Mufassireen of the Qur'an like Shaykh Al-Tabrasi in Majma' Al-Bayan he says this is a reference to the creation of day and night. That Allah, he mentions the earth and he also, Allah has created this vast universe, but he has not neglected this small planet. He has created a system whereby there is day and night. There is light and darkness in order for this planet to allow for life to flourish on it. If there was constant day, many living, almost all life would cease to exist on earth. So this alternation of day and night, light and darkness, is essential for the survival of living species on this earth. It's also possible, brothers and sisters, that this dhulumat and nur that's mentioned in this ayah is not talking about physical light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a reality that is beyond this physical world. This is metaphysical light and darkness. Because you find that Allah, when He mentions darkness, He, he mentions the plural form. Allah didn't say, وَجَعَلَ الظُّلْمَةَ وَالنُّورِ He mentions dark, the plural form of darkness, ظُلُمَات. And when He mentions nur, He doesn't say, وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ وَالْأَنْوَارِ Nur is what? Singular. ظُلُمَات is plural. And whenever Allah does this in the Quran, Allah is not talking about physical light. For example, if you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 257, what does Allah say? Allah is the guardian of the believers. He has wilaya over us. One aspect of his guardianship is that he guides us. يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النور. Does this mean Allah takes us from physical darkness into physical light? No. Allah is talking about guidance. He's speaking about the, the nur and the dhulumat that is perceived in alam al-malakut. There's a very famous Muslim philosopher by the name of Shihabuddin al-Sahruwardi. Many of you who have studied Islamic philosophy, maybe his name is familiar to you. He is known as Shaykh al-Ishraq. He is the founder of the, 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 illuminist, the illuminationist sect of Islamic philosophy. He has a theory where he says that everything in creation possesses a degree of light. In this worldly life, you cannot perceive it. But everything is made up of nur. And for those of you who go to uh, you know high school or university, if you take if you take quantum physics, not Newtonian physics, quantum physics, physicists have discovered that if you break anything down to its purest form, everything is energy, everything is light. Everything, even something you that doesn't have light. There is light there, but you just can't perceive it. Everything in creation, if you break it down to its simplest form, it's all energy. So, Allah, so Shihabuddin al Sahruwardi, he argues that everything has light. There are some entities that have a fixed degree of light. For example, the earth. The earth is not going to increase its nur or decrease it because it's not under trial. The sun, the moon, all of these inanimate objects, they are given a specific degree of nur and it's fixed. It doesn't change. The only beings that can increase their nur or decrease their nur are human beings and jinn. We're the only ones. When we're born, we're born with the light of our fitrah. We can add nur to the light of our fitrah through amal salih, through having the right aqidah, or we can diminish nur. We can diminish the light by committing sins. 
That's why Rasulullah says, for example, Salatul Layl Noor. Salatul Layl is the source of Noor. Citing the Quran to the heart. So all of these A'mal Salihah, they increase the Dhulumat in the plural form and Noor in the singular form. The Ulama of Tafsir, they say because Haq is always singular, and batil always comes in different forms. There's only one way for you to get exposure to light, and that is to remove the barriers. But there are many ways that you can block yourself from receiving light. You can lift your clothes and create a barrier. You can go to a different room. There are many ways that you can block this light, but there's only one way to enjoy it, and that is to remove the barriers. The last part of the ayah. This word, thumma, Allama Taba Tabai, what does he say? Yadullu ala ta'khir wa tarakhi. The word thumma means a period of time has passed. So, for example, if I say, Ja'a Muhammadun fazaydun. That means Muhammad came, and then immediately after Muhammad, Zayd came. That's if I use the, the word fa. Muhammad came first, and then immediately after, Zayd, with no time interval in between, immediately after. But if I say, Ja'a Muhammadun, thumma Zayd, what does that mean? Muhammad came, and then after some time, Zayd arrived. What does Allah say here? Kufr does not happen instantaneously because you have fitra. It takes time for you to pollute your fitra and enter into the world of kufr. So kufr is not something that just happens overnight. It takes a period of rejection of truth to become kafir. This is why this is why the word this is why Allah says the word thumma is used. Thumma alladhina kafaru billah or bi rabbihim. What does the ayah say? Thumma alladhina kafaru bi rabbihim ya'dilun. Allah is speaking to the mushrikeen of Mecca. The mushrikeen of Mecca are not atheists, by the way. If you go to Surah Luqman verse 25 Allah is speaking to an audience who believes in him they believe that Allah created the universe if you look at verse 25 from surah Luqman Allah tells the prophet ask the mushrikeen wala in sa'altahum o muhammad if you ask them man khalaqa samawati wal ard if you ask the pagans who created the heavens and the earth, Allah. without a doubt, they will say Allah created the heavens and the earth. So what, what, what's the problem with the mushrikeen? The mushrikeen believe Allah creates and then he steps back and the idols, they manage the affairs of the universe. That Allah is the type of Lord who creates and he doesn't interact with his creation. He doesn't engage with his creation. So their kufr is in what aspect of tawheed? So they believe in Allah's khaliqiyya. But they reject what? His rububiyya. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ They recognize that Allah is the creator of the universe. But they don't recognize that Allah is the caretaker and the maintainer of the universe. That's why if they want rain, they go to the idol. If they want their spouse, if they want, uh, they're having fertility issues, they go to the idol. If they're having problems, they go to the idol. Because they see the idols as the ones who manage the universe. And they recognize Allah as the, the creator who doesn't get involved. Allah says, no, I am the creator and I am the Rabb. I am the maintainer and I am the sustainer. 
Ya'dilun. Ya'dilun here means they assign an adil or an id, someone who is equal to him, someone who is similar to him, a partner to him. There's a hadith from Amir al Mu'minin. Are you tired, brothers and sisters? We can conclude here if you're tired. Is the time up? For, it's it's 8.50. So I think we're out of time. You want to you leave a couple of minutes for a Q&A and then inshallah next week we'll continue with verse 2? Okay. Ya'adilun means that these shirikeen, and in fact, let me share with you the following tradition from Amir al-Mu'minin. So I broke up this ayah into three parts for a reason. Alhamdulillah, alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard, part one. Waj'ala al-dhulumati wal-nur, part two. Thumma alladhina kafaru birabbihim, ya'adilun, part three. The raya from Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi where he says وَكَانَ فِي هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ رَدٌ عَلَى ثَلَاثَةِ أَصْنَاءِ Amir al-Mu'mineen he says this ayah is a refutation of three ideologies that existed in Arabia at the time مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا قَالَ ثلاثة أصناف منهم لما قال الحمد لله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض. أمير المؤمنين says the first part of the ayah when Allah says Allah created the heavens and the earth that was a refutation of what فكان ردا على الدهرية الذين قالوا إن الأشياء لا بد لها وهي دائم. Imam says the first part of the ayah where Allah says He created He brought the heavens and the earth into being is a refutation of those who believed that the universe was eternal and it has no beginning. If you look at some of the materialist philosophers of the 18th century, there were many philosophers who believed that the universe had no beginning and it's going to have no end. It's eternal. But here Allah says the universe has a beginning. I brought it into being. I created it. And this is also consistent with modern science because if you look and what uh, astrophysicists say, they say the universe is about 15 to 20 billion years old. It actually has an age. It had a beginning. It didn't always exist. Then the Imam salam says, ثُمَّ قَالْ وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ وَالنُّورِ And he made day and night. He made day and night. فَكَانَ رَدًّا عَلَى الثَّنَوِيَ There was an ideology where there was a belief that Light had its own Lord and darkness had its own Lord. That there was there was a Lord of darkness and there is a Lord of light. Allah says, I am the Lord of both. The one who made darkness is the same one who made light. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, ثُمَّ قَالْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ And those who reject the lordship, the rububi of Allah, they assign partners, they assign equals to him. The Imam says, فَكَانَ رَدًّا عَلَى مُشْرِكِي الْعَرَبِ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ أَوْثَانَنَا آلِهَا That this was a refutation of the polytheists of Mecca who placed these idols at the same level of Allah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is the real provider, but they would go to these idols for their provisions and for their care and for their health. And for their sustenance. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept the little that we offer to illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Akhir Da'wana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Tahirin. Can you please explain Yadidun a little bit first? 
يعدلون is the فعل مضارع it's the present tense verb of of عدل which means to to basically place something side by side to make something equal to something else to deem something similar to something else so يعدلون Allah uses the present tense verb يعدلون which means that this is something that the Kuffar were constantly doing on a daily basis. They were turning to other than Allah. They were turning to things that they were they were placing on the same pedestal as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Yeah, they They were constantly setting up rivals and and uh, and partners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So it comes from the the word Eid uh, or Ad, depending on the uh, the halak. It's an excellent question, and, and if you notice, there's a change in the verb. When Allah spoke about the heavens and the earth, He used the verb khalaqa. But when He speaks about dhulumat and nur, He doesn't say khalaqa, He says ja'ala. Yes? Do you see that? I have went through. I've gone through all of the tafsirs. I have not found a satisfying answer. To be honest with you, some say that one opinion is that khalaqa is for al joha, which means khalaqa is for the the essential the essential aspects of a creation, while jala is used for non-essential attributes. Again, they're very technical and they just, there's no evidence for it. So I haven't seen a very convincing explanation as to why there is this switch in uh, from khalaqa to ja'al. Wallahu alayhi. Even Allama Tabatabai, he doesn't have a definitive answer. But what's interesting is that we all know that darkness is not something that can be created because darkness is essentially the absence of light. Right? So it wouldn't make sense for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to say that he created darkness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created light and darkness is the absence of light. But perhaps it could be a reference to the fact that if we assume that khala, if we assume that darkness and light are not physical, there is nothing that Allah created that is absolutely dark. For example, the furthest entity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah is Nurul Anwar, He is the absolute light. And the strongest created light is the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He is the most illuminated being after Allah. He is the most illuminated created being. The furthest on the other side of the spectrum is who? Mr. Iblis, right? Iblis. He is the most darkened creation of Allah but is he absolutely dark to exist you have to have some nur otherwise you would you wouldn't exist this is why in dua kumail what do we say everything has received some nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it could be it could mean that if we say that Allah created darkness Yes, Allah created relative darkness because that darkness has some nur in it. But it's darkness in comparison to entities that have more light. Is that clear? And we also we always have to, you know, predicate these statements by saying Allahu al You know, we could be wrong. We say maybe this is the uh, unless we have a authentic tradition from the Ahlul Bayt that support these views we just have to say this is a possible opinion we always have to have the humility of saying that this could be wrong but, but, the literal meaning of ja'ala it could mean if you look at for example the quran when allah speaks about Allah appointed Imam. So it could mean appoint, 
When Allah speaks about the relationship between a husband and a wife, what's the ayah? وَمِنْ آيَاتِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا And he placed, in, he placed this reciprocal love between the uh, spouses. So it could mean made, it could mean appoint. These are some of the meanings of job. To assign, to appoint, to make. Khalaqa is something that is created from nothing. Um, Khalaqa is something that Allah creates from nothing, and Ja'ala is something that was already existent and He placed it. Or is there a difference in the two? Fakhrul Razi, this is his opinion. He says, Khalaqa, when Allah says Khalaqa, it means that He's creating something from nothing. But Ja'ala means that He's creating something from another created being. This is one opinion. So when Allah speaks about, what's an example in the Quran? When Allah speaks about, about Adam alayhi salam, وَجَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا that, that she was created from, the, uh, from uh, according to some traditions, from uh, a pre-existing material. From the tina of Adam alayhi salam. So this is one opinion that Ja'ala is used to refer to Allah creating something from an or already existing material, whereas Khalaqa is from, created from Adam. And Allah knows best. I, I mean, you would have to look at all of the verses in the Quran to see if this is consistent. Because all it takes is one example for it to be refuted. And one example that I can think of off the top of my hand that would disprove Fakhr al-Razi is that when Isa alayhi salam makes the mold of the bird, he says, Inni akhluqu lakum min al-teen kahayat al I am creating a bird from what? From this mud, from this clay. So Isa alayhi salam, he's creating a bird from already existing material. Why didn't he say Ja'ala? So I would have to disagree with Fakhr al-Razi because this is an example of a verse where khalaqa is used to bring something into being from already existing material. Yes, Shaykh, I have a question with regard to, uh, to Samawat. Um, you explained that, you repeat that? With regard to Samawat, yeah. Um, you explained how how large the samawats are, how um, how far they are away from each other. Um, so the question that comes to my mind is, what is actually the purpose of this huge world that uh, Allah created? Is He giving any indication for what the purpose of that is? Why does it have to be so big? Why does it have to be so big? Yeah. What we do know for certain is that Allah is Hakim. He wouldn't create such a vast universe without purpose. Now, part of his hikmah is probably that he, did, he doesn't tell us. Him not telling us is also possibly part of his hikmah. Allah hasn't revealed to us why the, why the universe is so vast. One possible reason, and this is just me thinking off the top of my head, is to remind us, because human beings have a tendency to be very arrogant. When you reflect over the size of the universe, it reminds you of how small you are. So it's a reminder that, oh, insan, don't be arrogant. Because even the earth that you see as massive, it's like a tiny speck in the context of this great universe. But there is, there is definitely, it's not, this is not an arbitrary decision by Allah for him to create this huge universe. There is hikmah, there is wisdom behind it. But Allah doesn't always share with us the wisdom behind His actions. And sometimes that in and of itself is a sign of His wisdom. So another question that I have with regard to Samawad, 
Another question that I have with regard to that is, as we know, um, researchers are looking for um, life on other planets and uh, trying to find out if there there is other places that, that they can find uh, life. Um, so how is how is uh, Quran looking at this? Is there any indication for there might be something else, or is it uh, categorically rejecting that there there might be some other life in other planets? The Quran definitely doesn't reject the possibility of uh, of life existing elsewhere in the universe. That's for sure. And the Quran also doesn't explicitly say that there is life that exists in other parts of the universe. The Quran leaves intentionally leaves it vague, but there seems to be verses, and inshallah, maybe in the next session I can share with you a verse or two where the Quran seems to hint that there are there are uh, ter ter there are terrestrial forms that exist in other parts of the universe, and the word dab is used to refer to the uh, living in the, in the heavens and not just only on earth. I don't have the verse with me at hand, but inshallah, I will definitely, uh, if I'm reminded, inshallah, in our next session, I, I, can, I can share with you during the Q&A session. But, you know, the, the, the Quran does mention, you know, al-aradun is sab the seven earths. And, and the word seven in Arabic doesn't necessarily mean literally seven. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the Aralun as Seb, it could be a reference that there are many Earth-like planets throughout the universe. And to be an Earth-like planet means that it should it should sustain life. So there are subtle hints within the Quran that there is a strong possibility that uh, that there are uh, living beings in other parts of the uh, in other parts of it. And the beauty of the Quran is that the, because the Quran is not a science book and the aim of the Quran is not to address these scientific issues, the Quran is intentionally very vague and ambiguous when it comes to these, uh, these issues. You're not going to find you know, an, an unequivocal uh, yes or no to, uh, to these questions. There are subtle signs and hints for those who are searching for these answers. Because again, the, the, the audience of the Quran is not a, is not a, is not a group of scientists. That's why in the next verse, inshallah, in verse number two, when Allah speaks about the creation of man, Allah doesn't speak about DNA. He doesn't use scientific jargon. He uses words that are understandable to someone who lives in the desert, to someone who is illiterate. Even the illiterate can understand the words that are being used. So Allah uses language that is common and understandable to the seventh century Arab and even those who come after. Because if Allah used scientific jargon, perhaps people re will reject Quran because they don't understand these terms. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Thank you very much.